Hello and welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to the GU-272. My name is Ginevra Morse. I am the Director of Education and Online Programs here at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programs for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is Megan Siekman, genealogist of the Newbury Street Press. Megan holds a PhD in history from Arizona State University, where her focus was public history and American Indian history. Prior to joining NEHGS, she worked as curator of the Fairbanks House in Dedham, Massachusetts, and as an archivist at the Heard Museum Library in Phoenix, Arizona. Megan's areas of interest include American Indian history and lineage, African American research, colonial New England, New York, and German genealogy, immigration to America, westward migration and settlement, and tracing maternal lines. In 1838, the Maryland Jesuits sold more than 300 enslaved people to sugar plantations in southern Louisiana in order to rescue Georgetown University from bankruptcy. In all, the Jesuits sold 314 men, women, and children over a five-year period stretching from 1838 to 1843. Today, these enslaved people are known collectively as the GU-272 ancestors. Working with a number of organizations, we have just launched a data-rich data website that shares the history of those enslaved people and the stories of their descendants. Today, Megan will walk you through some of the databases and resources available through this online portal. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. There is no handout uh, for this session, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you miss it, something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always go back, uh, pause, rewind, fast forward, um, and take your time with the presentation later. So without further ado, I will now turn things over to Megan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm about to introduce a very exciting project that we've been working on at American Ancestors. We've partnered with the Georgetown Memory Project to make a searchable and accessible database of the research materials relating to the GU-272 and their descendants. Additionally, we have created a beautiful website to house the history of the GU-272 and stories of the descendants, as well as some helpful resources that we hope can help you find your GU-272 connection or learn more about this important story. Uh, to start today, I'm going to give you a bit of the history of the project and the GU-272 using a case study of the Butler family. Then I'm gonna give you a peek at the website and what sources you'll find there. And then finally, we'll take a look at the database and the ways to search for GU-272 ancestors. So we'll start uh, with a bit of background about the GU-272. A Community Betrayed and Exiled is the name of an article that recently appeared in American Ancestors magazine and is now available on the website I'm gonna show you today. Uh, this is a nice history of the sale and also of the GU-272 at the beginnings of the Georgetown Memory Project um, and will give you a kind of an overview of uh, what these people faced as they made their migration down to Louisiana. So in 1838, Jesuit priests at Georgetown University sold over 272 enslaved people to Louisiana sugar plantations. Um, and the owners of these plantations were Jesse Beatty and Henry Johnson. Henry Johnson was a congressman from Louisiana who had previously served his state as governor and a U.S. Senator. The sale of the GU-272 has never been a secret at Georgetown. Um, the documents of the sale are well preserved and they were even um, some recent published works about the university's connection to slavery. 
Nevertheless, the history of Jesuit slaveholding failed to penetrate the consciousness of most members of the Georgetown community in the modern era. In the fall of 2015, in the wake of Harvard, Columbia, Brown, and other universities admitting their past involvement in slavery, students at Georgetown demanded to know more and began protesting the names of two buildings on campus named for Jesuit priests responsible for the sale. This pushed the story into the media. The university established a working group to investigate the matter. Adam Rothman, a historian and member of the university's working group, began combing through the college archives, looking for pre-sale references to the GU-272. Out of the efforts of this working group came the Georgetown Slavery Archive, a digital archive of documents and materials related to the GU-272 and slavery at Georgetown. And I'll show you a number of the documents that they do have on their site um, as we go through the history of the Butler family. The media attention to the protests inspired, um, that the protests inspired grabbed the attention of Georgetown alumni, Richard Cellini, a Massachusetts lawyer and entrepreneur in the tech industry. He first contacted the university to ask what happened to the slaves. The response was that they had all died of a fever upon reaching Louisiana. This did not sit well with Richard and other alumni and supporters founded the Georgetown Memory Project in order to find out what happened to the GU-272 and their descendants. They hired Baton Rouge-based genealogist Judy Riffle and Maryland-based genealogist uh, Melissa Ruffner to research the GU-272 and their descendants. To date, the GMP have identified 215 of the original 272 and over 8,000 direct descendants. Richard Cellini found Judy Riffle because in his search for more answers on the Jesuit slaves, he came across Patricia Bayonne Johnson's blog. Long before the story had made national news, descendant Patricia discovered her family's connection to the Jesuits when she hired Judy Riffle to research um, her Hicks ancestors in Iberville Parish, Louisiana for a family reunion in 2004. Patricia's ancestors, Nace and Bibby Butler, were owned by Jesse Beatty on the West Oak Plantation in Maraguin, Iverville Parish, Louisiana, which was owned by Jesse Beatty. Uh, Judy knew from prior experiences that Jesse had purchased a number of slaves from Maryland. It was during a trip to the Iverville Parish Courthouse that Judy unearthed the inventory of Beatty's estate, which included Patricia's ancestors, Nace and Bibby Butler. Another document Riffle found was the sale of 64 slaves by Thomas Moldy and to Henry Johnson on behalf of Jesse Beatty. Patricia sent the data to her aunt, who then Googled Moldy's name to discover that he was a Jesuit priest. Upon researching him further, it revealed that Bayon Johnson's Louisiana ancestors originated in Jesuit-owned plantations in Maryland. We'll follow Patricia's ancestors, Nace and Bibby Butler, just to give you a sense of the types of documents used in this research. These deeds include detailed information about those enslaved that we can't always hope to find in original records when we're researching African-American ancestors and enslaved ancestors. As you can see here, the deeds include names and ages of each individual, sometimes noting familial relationships. Um, so you see I underlined Nace and Bibby here. It also gives their ages and then their children follow them in the list. I think we skipped one. Oh, maybe the picture did something weird. Um, sorry, we're having a little tech difficulty. Um, we'll just go on to the Katherine Johnson. So we know that Nace and Bibby made it to New Orleans because they are on the manifest for the Katherine Johnson, or Jackson, Katherine Jackson, excuse me, uh, which left Alexandria on the 13th of November, 1838, and arrived in New Orleans on the 6th of December, 1838. Um, so we know that the, the story that they all perished in a fever is not accurate. 
And then here's a map uh, from 1848 that includes Jesse Beatty's plantation, which was directly between land owned by Henry Johnson and Henry Thibodeau. And you can see I've kind of pulled out the square here um, of where that land was located. There's also another plantation that Henry Johnson owned in Ascension Parish, um, which also this arrow here is pointing towards. So these are just two of the locations that the descendants ended up. Others also ended up in Terrebonne Parish, um, which is where Jesse Beatty also um, owned land. So to follow the Butler family forward, you need to turn to records for the slave owner. And this is pretty typical in all slave research um, that you might uh, try to venture on. Um, most enslaved individuals are not listed in records on their own. They're going to be recorded in records for the slave owners. And typically those are going to be things like account records, inventories, uh, probate records, and the like. So after Jesse Beatty died, his family sold West Oak and the enslaved people working on the land, including Nace and Bibby, to Washington Barrow and his son, John Barrow. And this is in January of 1853. And you can see I've underlined here um, where Nace and Bibby are recorded in these documents, as are some of their children, though not all of them are present in this record. And the family was sold again in 1856, along with West Oak Plantation. This is a uh, newspaper ad um, that is advertising the sale of the plantation and listing all of the enslaved uh, individuals as well. Um, the property passed to the Woolfolk family and by emancipation, widow Emily Woolfolk owned the West Oak Plantation and even made work agreements with some of the former slaves who worked on the plantation following emancipation. And then this finally brings us to the 1870 federal census. And remarkably, Nace and Bibby survived all of that turmoil to appear on the first federal census that included former slaves by name. So here we hit the 1870 brick wall, as it's often known in African-American genealogical research. Um, but typically we hit this brick wall going the other direction. So as you're working backwards on your family lines, a lot of folks come to the 1870 census and can't find any records earlier than that that include their enslaved ancestors by name. Um, in this case, moving forward in this family, um, I'll show you as we go through the database uh, later on in this presentation, um, other types of records that we've been able to follow this family forward. But one of the things that you might want to note just in this record here is that Nace and Bibby mentioned, they actually include in the record that they were born in Maryland. Um, so this is another clue to their connection back to uh, the Jesuit owned plantations. Um, if you need some pointers about the basics of genealogy, um, I'll have a list of resources for you at the end of the presentation that could help you if you're trying to get back to this point or see if you have some sort of connection to the GU-272. And then I kind of just wanted to end this um, basic overview of kind of how the flow went um, following this one family with a picture of another family. Um, this is a picture of Frank Campbell and this is one, he is one of the original GU-272, who was born in Maryland about 1819 and died in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana, about 1916. And this is the only known photograph that we have of an original GU-272, so it's very special. Um, and now I just want to get into showing you a little bit about the website. Um, first, I just want to give you an idea of who we are and how we got involved in this work. So the GU-272 Memory Project began in 2017 when Richard Cellini and the Georgetown Memory Project approached American ancestors about creating a database of all the research compiled by Judy Riffle of the GU-272. And within that, our goals for this project have developed over time. So the more we had been working on creating the database and the website, um, 
we then got into also trying to preserve the stories of descendants. So this is a rundown of kind of our goals. Um, the first is to create a searchable and accessible database of research on the GU-272 and their descendants. The second is to share the story of the GU-272 and, and helpful resources through our website. So these include resources that can help you with your genealogy research, um, resources that can help you with African American research, um, and also things that can help you find your GU-272 connection. And then our third goal is to document, preserve, and share oral histories of descendants as part of the continuing legacy of the GU-272. So there are a number of organizations that we are associated with or have worked with um, or have some knowledge of that you might want to be aware of in working on this project. So I've mentioned the Georgetown Memory Project um, and how that we are partnered directly with them to create the GU-272 Memory Project and that we are American ancestors. Um, we are part of the New England Historic Genealogical Society um, and we're dedicated to helping people research their families and their family histories. You would, if you're thinking that you're a GU-272 descendant, you definitely want to be aware of the GU-272 Descendants Association. They're based in Louisiana and they're a nonprofit organization established and operated by GU-272 descendants, dedicated to preserving the memory commemorating the lives and restoring the honor of the 272 enslaved people sold by the Jesuits. Uh, the GU-272 is a voice for all GU-272 descendants and advocates on behalf of the GU-272 community. There are also other groups, the Georgetown University's Working Group on Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation. I mentioned earlier, this is that group that formed by Georgetown University um, to by Georgetown University's president in 2015 to, quote, reflect upon our university's history and involvement in the institution of slavery, end quote. Um, this group has developed the Georgetown Slavery Archive, which is on their website. If you just Google Georgetown Slavery Archive, you can find it. Um, and they've worked to digitize a number of documents related to, directly to the sale and also um, documents of the GU-272 earlier than the slave or than the sale and also other enslaved individuals that um, may have not been directly involved in the sale. Um, there are also other descendant organizations and these are descendant organizations that are focused on descendants of a particular ancestor. So the GU-272 Isaac Hawkins legacy um, are, is an organization for descendants who are direct descendants of Isaac Hawkins. Um, the legacy of the GU-272 Alliance um, is a organization that traces the descendants of Cornelius or Nellie Hawkins, um, one of the slaves that wound up on the West Oak Plantation in Maryland. And then the Campbell family is a private organization comprised of descendants of Frank Campbell and Mary Jane Mahoney Campbell. Um, and their primary mission is to locate and unite GU-272 descendants of Frank and Mary Jane, um, as well as Bot and Therese Bainey Campbell. Um, so if you're interested in any of these organizations, their information and contact information or websites are all included on our website. We have teamed up with Dr. Linda Mann of the Georgetown Memory Project to conduct oral histories with descendants of the GU-272. So far, we have been extremely lucky to collect around 40 oral hist over 40 oral histories from descendants. Um, we've made trips to Louisiana, a few trips to Louisiana to conduct these interviews, as well as California and Maryland. Um, and we've collected stories from descendants in each of those locations in addition to Washington State, Alabama, South Carolina, and other states across the country, depending on where people traveled from to meet with us. 
Um, so we're really trying to get a full view of descendants' lives, where they ended up, um, and the successes and challenges that they faced throughout their lives, and document that history as it's just as important as the GU-272, the original GU-272 story. So this will, um, the, the oral histories that you'll be able to see on our website are really um, from the sale to the present, you know, in their, in their family memory stories. A lot of folks have been able to give us a lot of good genealogical information in their oral histories or even just memories they have of their grandparents. So this is, these are really stories from the sale to the present as the legacy of the GU-272. And in these meetings, we also have a great opportunity to collect photographs and mem memorabilia of family along with their stories. And this has also been a great way to encourage descendants to get connected to each other and reminisce about their families. Um, we often have a great time hearing about all the, the people in these photographs um, and, and all the stories connected to them. So we're really trying to create a, a place where we can preserve these family histories and these stories um, in a way that really gives them the, the highlight that they deserve um, on our website. So now is the exciting part. Um, we're gonna take a look at our new website. Now, one thing that I wanna make sure that everyone is very well aware of before we go any further, I mean, first you can see how beautiful it is that the team did a really great job of um, designing this website. Um, but you'll note that I have the note here that this is a work in progress. So we just launched the website. Um, you can go to that link right now if you wanted to, gu272.americanancestors.org and see the live site. Um, but I want everyone to be aware that it is a work in progress. And for the purposes of this webinar, we've released the site early, but we are continuing to smooth out any, a few wrinkles, including a thorough review of all of the content. So we will thank you for your patience while we get it perfect. Um, another thing to note is that the searchable database is complete. So you can use that as much as you like. Um, the site has not been tested for mobile devices, and we're working on that. So if you wish to view it on a smartphone or tablet, please try again in a week or so. Um, and one of the most important things we want to note is that we will be adding new descendant voices over time. So we've interviewed more than 40 descendants, and we're working hard at getting those clips edited and ready for viewing. But it takes time to go through each one, pick clips, and then make sure that we have photographs and other things to go along with that. So the process takes a while. Um, so if we've interviewed you and you don't see yourself on the site yet, please do not be discouraged. We will be adding you. Um, and we are not actively promoting the website until mid-June to give us some time to get all of the content right. Um, so if you have any comments um, or questions about the site in the meantime, um, I will at the end of this presentation give you some idea of how you can contact us um, so that you can let us know. <clears throat> when you get to our website, so that first slide I just showed you is kind of what you'll see when you pull up the, the website. And it might look like you're just, are, that's the page itself, but I want you to keep scrolling down because that's where most of the content and um, the, the beautiful, parts of our site are. So keep scrolling down. As you go down, you're going to see several videos on the site from descendants and professionals that have been working on the project. So here you can hear the stories of the descendants and their families in their own words um, and gain a better sense of how the research and work of the GU-272 memory project um, took place. So you'll see that we have um, kind of these perspectives. A few of these are descendants and researchers as well. Patricia's on there. Um, Dr. Linda Mann uh, is on talking about oral histories and the process behind that. And then down here we have descendant voices. Um, these are clips from the oral histories that we have 
done. Um, and you'll see that each one kind of has a little description of what the individual is talking about. Um, and we're working to make these even nicer as we're able to collect more photographs related to what the individual is talking about. So these will change. There will be more uh, descendant voices added to this site over time as we're able to get through those clips. As you continue to scroll down, you'll see all of the family groups, um, starting with their GU-272 ancestor, and these are in alphabetical order. And what's really beautiful about this website is that all of these faces that you see on either side of the family groups are descendants that we've met or have, re have interviewed, um, and they've great graciously allowed us to put their photographs up here on the website, but it's a nice way to, to um, see some of the faces of the GU-272. Now, when you click on one of those family groups, so here we have Nace Butler, each family page has a narrative of the GU-272 ancestor, um, so that's up here and their immediate family that were involved in the slaves so, or in the sale. So this is um, kind of a, a narrative of who Nace Butler was um, and what information we have on him and his direct family. And from here, you can do a number of different things in this bar here. So you can search our database right here. Um, and then this link here, go to the family tree. This will take you to the Ancestries page for Nace Butler and his family. Um, and I'll show you that in a little bit as well. Or you can click on Family Genealogy PDF, and that will bring you directly to a PDF file which has the family register for starting with Nace Butler and his family moving forward. So you can just print out the register if you'd like to from there. And then as you keep scrolling down, there are a number of different articles that you can click on as well um, to get some more information about the GU-272 and any kind of research materials we have. So you can see we have uh, who were the GU-272, um, how do I find my GU-272 ancestor. These are articles that you can click on to get more information. You just wanna click the little read more button as you go down. And then support this project um, if you're interested in, in offering support to the project. And then we also have um, the option to sign up for updates about how we're doing. Um, and that way you can see what new oral histories have gone on the site or if we have any new additions to the site that you might wanna check out. Now, if you go back up to the top of the page, so we've kind of scrolled all the way down, um, we have this nice bar here at the top, um, and there's all different types of places that you can go from here that have a number of different resources that might be helpful to you. So if you click on the GU-272 history page, you'll get this um, listing here. And we have a, the article that I mentioned earlier, so a community betrayed, um, is the article here. And when you click on that, I've kind of, kind of pulled it out here so you can see how we've stylized that on the next page. Um, or I guess this is the timeline, but they kind of look similar. Um, but you can go through and read the article or do this historical timeline. Now the historical timeline that we put together um, starts with the 1838 sale and goes to the present. And this covers a number of different um, more national historic events. Um, so, you know, kind of Brown versus Board of Education, that sort of thing. Um, particularly things that related to topics that individuals in our oral histories talked about. So a lot of people we interviewed talk, talked about their experiences with desegregations of schools. Um, so we wanted to kind of give an idea of the different uh, more national changes um, that would have affected individual GU-272 descendants. And then we also, at the very end of that, kind of give a rundown of the history of the knowledge of this history. So how that came to be, um, 
kind of some of the stuff that I talked about in the very beginning of the presentation, but you can kind of see it laid out in a timeline format. And now the next page or the next thing that you could click on is finding the GU-272. And here we've compiled a couple of different resources that can help you um, kind of navigate the GU-272 ancestors in a couple of different ways. So we have the who were the GU-272 uh, master spreadsheet. Um, so this kind of goes through everything. It's a spreadsheet of everything that we know about each of the GU-272 ancestors. Um, so this can be a nice way to kind of search um, for information. Um, you can download this and, and put it on your web, on your computer if you want. Um, we also have a section that will give you an idea of what are the GU-272 family groups. So I don't know if you noticed when we were looking at the family group pages, each group, ha each family has a group number. Um, so this is where you'll find an explanation of what are those group numbers and how does that relate to my ancestor. Um, it gives a nice explanation as to how that all works um, in case you're confused about that. And then we also have a request form, which I'll show you again um, at the end of the presentation. But this is where if you think you have a GU-272 connection um, and you would like more information or help with what you should do with that information, you can then click on this request form um, and fill that out and send it to us. Then the next tab is the GU-272 families. Now this has a listing of each one of the families. Um, you can see here that we have Nace Butler's family here. Um, and this is a direct link to uh, the PDF registers. So you can access them here if you're just interested in printing out the information on the family. Um, so you can do that from this page here. And then in the research help section, here's where we've tried to compile as many resources that might be able to help you. If you're doing research on your family, you think you have a G272 connection, or you've hit some sort of stumbling block or roadblock, we've kind of compiled as much information as we can here to help you with that. Um, so the first article is finding your GU-272 ancestor. This is a listing of the, the common clues that you have a connection, um, as well as the different types of resources, um, websites, organizations, um, museums, all of those types of things that could help you in determining that connection um, can be found here. And then um, finding your African-American ancestors is an article about um, how you would search for African-American ancestors in a more general sense, so not just specifically to the GU-272, but more generally. Um, we also have a listing of cultural and historical institutions that are focused on African-American history. Um, this is a very long list. We co compiled this by state. Um, and so you can also utilize this to see what there may be what resources may be available to you in your own in your home state that could help you further. Um, and then we also have a link to our African American genealogy subject guide that's on our website. Um, so this could be a great resource to help you if you're just kind of getting started with your family genealogy and aren't quite sure how to make some of these connections. Um, that does include a link to our African American genealogy web, our webinar that we did, um, uh, and that can help you kind of if you're just getting started with this research. And then we also have some articles that were on the root.com, and these are various questions from um, people who send in questions on African American genealogy that might be helpful to you. Um, and then we also have um, links to different articles in charts on our American Ancestors webpage um, that may be helpful in organizing your information and um, then seeing how, how you would further your genealogical research. So the Research Help tab is, is a good resource if you're just getting started or are looking for more information. And then finally, we have our About tab. Um, here's where you can get an idea of the organization. So we have an organization's who's who. So you can see 
who the players are, who we have been working with, um, what organizations might be helpful to you. We have like a description of each one of those. Um, we also have a description of our permissions policy. So this goes through the permissions that we receive from um, the individuals who did the oral histories with us. Um, if you have any questions about the content on our websites or concerned about the content on our website, um, this gives you a, a place that you can then contact us to let us know that. Um, and that way we can be aware if there is something that you're concerned about. We also have a frequently asked questions section, and this is very detailed. Um, we've tried to address almost any question that we could think of that might come up. So if you have a question or concern, you might want to check here first. Um, in any cases where your question might direct you to an entity other than ourselves, we have um, given you that information so that you can know who to contact. And then we also have an article that just explains why we've done oral histories and why we're working on putting those on our site. So now I want to give you a little tour of our database um, so that you can use that to hopefully help find your connection or learn more about your ancestor. So this database, the GU272 Descendants uh, 1785 to 2000, uh, this database is organized into volumes. So each volume is based on a register style report. Um, on the descendants of the original families. So register style report is going to start with the original uh, GU272 ancestor and work forward um, in the family, giving you as much information as far as birth, marriage, and death goes for each individual. Um, the volume name will include the name of the head of the family followed by the group number in parentheses. So this is where you could figure out your group number based on um, your GU272 ancestor. And then the final volume that we have included in our volume list is, a, is entitled Source Documents, and this contains indexed images of the birth, marriage, and death certificates for people who are documented in the registers reports in earlier volumes. So any birth, marriage, or death records that we have um, in our possession that we were then able to put up on the site could be found in this um, source documents. Although it would be kind of clunky if you wanted to browse the source documents because they're not in any particular order. Um, but they will come up if you're searching for a particular butler, let's say, or a particular ancestor and you're searching for their name. If there are any documents, original documents that we have for that individual, they will pop up in the search. Um, the database contains 50 volumes with nearly 1,000 images and over 10,000 records and 32,000 searchable names. Each report, this is important, each report is limited to a maximum of four generations. So any person born on or after the 1st of January 1919 is excluded completely from the report. And this is for privacy reasons. Um, so the record types that are indexed include birth, baptism, marriage, death, and burial information. Um, and we don't, didn't want to have any of that information um, for any people who could potentially still be living, um, which is why there is that cutoff point of 1919. Um, all available names, including parents and spouses, um, have also been indexed, so they are searchable as well. Um, these documents are free, so this database is free to search, but you must create a guest account in order to view it. So I don't want you to be discouraged if you click on something and <laughs> you're searching and you get this big uh, notice here that says you need to log in. Um, you do not have to pay for anything. If you just click on the guest member here, join as a guest member, um, that will bring you to another screen that gives you the information about the guest benefits. And this is free access um, to select online databases. The GU272 database is free. You just need to create a guest account to log in. Um, and just so that you can see when you get to that point, this will also give you an idea of all of the other databases that you can also access for free um, once you create that uh, free guest account. And just so you can see here, the only things that we're going to ask you, um, this is what you click on when you say you want to sign up, 
the only things we're going to ask you for is your email, um, a password that you'll create, and your name. So there's no credit card information given. There's no, um, you know, if you want to give us more information about your interests in genealogy, you can do that as well. Um, but we're not going to ask you for any kind of payment to have a guest account. So then back to the database. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can search the database. Um, you can type in a name here if you wanted to do a search. Um, you can see here I kind of put in Nace Butler um, and we'll kind of go through that process here. But there's also the option to browse the database by name and this will pull up the um, register style report for the, in the individual um, that is listed here in the volume. So each one of these volumes is the register report itself. Um, when you're searching in the database, um, a couple of things that you might just want to be aware of. Um, if you're searching with family members included here, um, we do suggest just using a first name instead of using the last name. Sometimes it can get clunky to research if you put in too much information um, into the search. Um, but this will then return anything that we have in our database that includes any of this information that you put in here. And you can search by record type if you're only interested in pulling up um, those original records. You can do that as well. If you put in a search and you're getting no results, I would go back into your search and start limiting things down to see, um, you know, so if you start by putting in all, the name and the years and the record type and you're not getting any type of information back, um, you might want to go back and limit some of those search options just to see what you can get. But in our search for Nace Butler here, um, you can see the, t the how things are displayed when you get them returned. Um, you can see up here how many um, search results you're looking at. So this is 1 to 50 of 964 records that include his name. Um, so this is likely because these are all for people that are in his line that would have been included in that original uh, register with his name. Um, so then what you would do is you can click right on um, the name here or you can click view image if you just want to see the image of whatever it is but the information over here will tell you what volume that's pulling out of so you can see here that this is from Nace Butler's volume so this is going to be the register itself um, if the volume here said source documents it's going to be an original birth marriage or death record um, that you would be viewing if you viewed the image So if you click on uh, NACE and you go to, this is the next screen that you'll see when you click on that. And you can see here that we have the register report here, which you could view larger by clicking on view. Um, it gives you kind of the basic information about him um, and birth location and the volume number. And then there's also the option down here to look for other people who are included on this page to see if there are any other records available for them. And then if you're interested in saving this direct link to this information, you can um, save this link here. Uh, that will bring you back to this spot every time you want to view this. And then if you click on the register itself, this is what the information looks like. So you can see that we start here with the first generation um, and all of this information is cited. Um, the view here didn't show me the citations at the bottom, but I think they're all in endnotes. So you can see here that we um, have citations. Um, what you can see here that we actually have citations for the information so that you can then go um, and see exactly where this information came from and pull those original records if you need to. Not all of the records that are cited in the register are going to be in our source documents collection. And this is because some of them have come from Ancestry.com and FamilySearch.org and we did not have the rights to put them up on our site itself. Um, but you can look at the source citations to see exactly where they came from and then duplicate that information for yourself um, and go and find them at those sources. 
If you are pulling up something that has the original document included, you can see here that the volume is source documents. That gives you an idea that this is an original document. Um, you can then view it larger. And when you view it here, you have the option to download it to your own uh, computer. You could print it. Um, and then also the print range button is a nice option if you're trying to print, say, the whole register or a number of documents in a row. You can say that you want to print from a certain page to a certain page. Um, you can see that this is page 132. Um, so you can print a range of pages instead of having to download each page individually. So that's a nice way to, to print out a number of things at a time if you want to do that. And then our last option for each of these individuals, now there was a link to the ancestry trees in the family group page on the website, if you remember that. Um, these are also included and listed on the home page of the database as well. So if you scroll down, you'll see all these listing of names. And when you click on an individual, so if we're doing Nace Butler again, group 27, and click on that, that brings you to the family tree. So this is an American Ancest Trees. Again, you do need a, a free guest account in order to view this. Um, but what's nice about this is that it's going to start with Nace Butler here and Bibby, um, and th that's going to give you their children and then their children. So you can continue even clicking these arrows and going further in time um, so that you can see all of the connections throughout the whole family tree. And when you click on him himself, it's going to give you um, some more information, you know, kind of basic information about him and then also um, his spouse, children, um, and that sort of thing. So this is a nice way to kind of view the families um, in, outside of the register report, but to see them in a family tree format. So a couple of things I just want to remind you of um, before we wrap up for questions. Um, but we do have that research help question. So if you're looking for more information about how you might do African American genealogical research, this is the site that you want to, this is the spot that you want to come to on the website. Um, and these uh, articles here and documents here will help you do that, uh, especially the African American genealogy um, subject guide. There's a lot of information on here, including the webinar that you can then watch that can give you a great place to start in doing research. If you hit a brick wall and you need more information or more help with that, and um, we do have a research services department that will help you with research um, if, you, if you need that. And I do want to remind you again that you can, at the very bottom of the home page for the website, you can sign up to receive occasional updates about how we're doing with the website, what new information there might be up there. Um, this is probably going to be a quarterly um, thing that we'll send out just to give you an idea of new updates to the site um, and new updates to the project. So do sign up for that. And then again, if you're looking for um, more information about your GD272 ancestor, how you might connect to others, um, how that may help or not with um, access to Georgetown University, any of that type of information you can include here in the request form. And this again is under the finding the GU272 tab on the website. Um, you can fill this all out and complete the, once you complete the form, it'll send it to us so that we can help you with um, any of those requests. All right. Well, thank you, Megan, for your great presentation. So let's pause here and uh, take any questions that you may have. If you have something that you'd like to ask Megan, go ahead and type it into the questions panel to the right of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, all right, so let's get to some of these questions. Um, now, Carol asks, uh, 
did these, did any of the GU-272 ancestors that we've been referring to, did they have surnames when they were sold? Uh, you know, for example, you know, Nace Butler. Um, can you explain that? Yes, um, a number of them on the original sale documents had surnames, and it appears to be that the Jesuits, the Jesuits owned slaves for a number of generations before the sale occurred, and some of these surnames had been in the families for that entire span of time. Um, they could possibly be connected to even former slave owners, um, but each, all of these, all of the G272 were Catholics um, that are included in sacramental records uh, of the Catholic Church at Georgetown. Um, so a number of these families, including the Butler family, we can trace back even further than the original sale. Um, so some of them did have surnames for a long time. Others that were included in the um, sale documents did not have surnames. Um, and I, I should say too that we have a number of the original GU-272 that we either have very little information about, these could be those that didn't have surnames um, or didn't have descendants that we can follow. Um, so there's only a, a number of families that we're able to trace forward. So not all of the GU-272 are gonna be included in those register reports, um, just simply because there's not enough information to trace them forward. Um, but they have been identified. So yes, some had surnames for um, b before the sale and others were included in the sale documents without surnames. Now, this is kind of a big question, but um, I'm hoping you can provide some tips. Um, mostly, you know, in family history, we're typically working from the present and then working our way backwards in time. If you know of, um, if you have an, an, another enslaved person's name, um, perhaps not part of GU-272, but you're interested in researching their descendants, how do you kind of go about that? Um, so this is kind of talking about descendant research instead of what we what we typically do, which is kind of ancestral uh, research. So if, do you have any tips on that? Yeah, so it's kind of a, a different way than genealogists are accustomed to working, right? Moving towards the future um, is, instead of going towards the past. Um, sometimes one of the things that I, I will suggest is that you do kind of end up having to work both ways at the same time. So as you're, if you're trying to work forward, say you have a, um, a slave owning ancestor and you found slaves listed in their probate record, and you wanna to try to trace those people forward in time and figure out what happened to them. This is a common question that I get um, from people doing research on, on their slave owning ancestors. Um, it can be a tricky thing, uh, especially depending on you know, the time frame. Um, but the, the best thing that you can do is, is, is kind of the same methods that you would apply towards working backwards. You would kind of stay in the same area to start and see if you can find people um, in the next, gener you know, next decade um, that are recorded under the same name. Um, and then use methods to f kind of compare um, information that you have on the people you're finding and the people that you know are the, the people you're looking for uh, to test out to see if that information lines up and that they could be the same person. Um, but sometimes that requires, you know, moving a little bit forward or what you think is a little bit forward and then kind of going backwards again to make sure that all that information is kind of checking out. So, you know, in a way it's not as daunting as it as it may seem to work forward instead of working backwards because even in genealogy where you're working backwards in time, you still end up having to kind of go back and forth a number of times just to double check your information. Um, so, but it is, it, it is kind of a different path than we normally take. I suspect though that most folks that would be looking for a connection um, to the GU-272 are kind of gonna be working in both directions at the same time. So if you've noticed on um, the page that we have about how you find your GU-272 ancestor on the website, 
Um, and you've noticed that, you know, some of the common clues of being a descendant, such as, you know, your family is um, Catholic or you have a connection to certain parishes in Louisiana, or you have stories that your family, you know, was from Maryland or from up north and that they ended up in Louisiana. These are all kinds of common clues that there is, uh, particularly if you have um, certain surnames and we've listed all those out and the Georgetown Memory Project has listed all those out um, so that you can have an idea of if your family's fitting into any of these common clues. Um, and then, you know, from there, you might be trying to work back on your family tree while you're also moving forward. Uh, well, you can use our site to move forward on particular lines with the same surnames to see if you can find an ancestor that matches up on both counts. So it would probably be a lot of working in both directions um, in order to, to find that connection. Thank you, Megan. As I said, I know that's a big question and probably deserving of its own webinar. So maybe in the future, we'll do something on uh, descendancy research. Um, so uh, Francis says that uh, it was only through DNA, a DNA test, that I learned I am a descendant. What is my next step? I did get the surnames um, and groups from Ancestry DNA. So what, what might uh, a next step be? We've met a lot of descendants um, that we've actually interviewed that aren't in the same boat. So they've done a DNA test or have come across it in, a, in another way to, to find that they are a descendant that way and are still trying to figure out exactly where that comes about. And that's where I think, you know, the method of if you can trace back as much as you can from your own, from what you know about your family and then utilizing something like the research that's already been done on the GU-272 working forward on this site um, and trying to find a spot where you can kind of find some overlap um, or finding a, a document that might be a close, a close match. Um, and this is where the descendant organizations can be really helpful as well, um, particularly in reaching out to other descendants um, if you're matching up closely with certain people or certain surnames, um, they can help you get in contact with others that might be closely related that could help you flesh out some of your own ancestry that could lead you back to making that connection. Um, so I would definitely reach out to the descendant organizations, particularly if you're thinking you're falling into that Hawkins um, or the Campbell lines that have um, de descendant organizations specifically for those families. Uh, the the GU272 Descendants Association is also helpful at, at trying to, to make those connections for you. So, I mean, you can utilize the information that we've collected on the database um, and the research that Judy has done um, to kind of bring the families forward. And then utilize things on our website, such as the African American Subject Guide, um, to help you further your genealogy working backwards on your own family lines and then try to see if you can get those two things to connect. Um, now, Diane asks, is there any documentation on um, where Georgetown acquired any of the enslaved people that were ultimately sold? Um, is there any uh, known information about that uh, and where would you look to find that? That's actually something that I'm not 100% sure about. Um, and that's, you know, mainly because what I've been focused on in this project is kind of working from the sale forward. But I do know that Georgetown, their slavery archive has a number of documents um, on the people that were enslaved by the Jesuits on the Maryland plantations um, for generations earlier than the sale. Um, so that might be a good place to start. And also just kind of looking at a general history of the uh, Jesuit plantations in Maryland. Um, so there were, I, I believe, five different plantations in Maryland that were all owned by the Jesuits that kind of fed into Georgetown University. Um, and they might, there. I would imagine that there's been some research done that might give you an indication as to um, where exactly folks came from in Africa, if their sales directly to the Jesuits from Africa or not, um, or where they might have acquired those. I mean, the from what I've seen, the um, documentation that has been preserved is pretty rich in comparison to other, um, you know, institutions where slavery was um, 
active. So it, I would imagine that there's some information, but I just don't directly have that answer for you. All right. Well, thank you again, Megan. Thank you, everyone, for your fantastic questions. I will be, as I mentioned, uh, at the start of this presentation, this has been recorded. Once it's available on our website, you will receive a follow-up email from me with a link to the recording. I'll also include in that email a direct link to the GU272 uh, website, a link to the request form. So if you do have some additional questions or you want to learn how to prove perhaps your GU272 connection, um, you can enter that there and I'll also include a link to the newsletter so if you want to stay up to date with what's happening with the project I would definitely recommend signing up for that quarterly newsletter. If you need more one-on-one -on -one help with your research you may consider also scheduling a consultation with one of our experts or even hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those services by contacting the emails on your screen. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.